We are a, a part of government which was established um, really to make the UK uh, the, the best place in the world to uh, invest in this technology and also the, the first place in the world for this technology to, to become uh, mainstream. Um, but one of the other things that we uh, exist to do is, is really to, I suppose, to, to think about how this technology might come to market, so what, what the business models might look like and what the implications might be on society um, so that we can uh, make sure we influence that in, in the most positive way that has the best outcomes uh, for citizens. Um, and, and, and just to expand on that, so I um, was talking to a, a good friend recently and he was telling me about a, um, a programme that he had watched, a satirical programme in, in which uh, one of the characters went back in time and was trying to describe to these people uh, in, in, from in the past, uh, he was trying to describe the internet to them. Uh, and he had a very kind of basic uh, logo for the internet. And his description uh, to these people in the past was uh, a dark carnival of humanity's most wretched impulses. Um, and I thought, well, you know, that, that is one potential uh, sort of interpretation of, of, of the internet as we know it. Um, but I think we would also argue that, um, that, you know, it has had many positive applications. It's enhanced our lives in many ways. Um, but I think that's an example of, the, the, you know, the World Wide Web um, is an is, is a extremely disruptive technology um, that um, you could argue um, was unleashed on society um, without any real kind of beta testing. So there was no sort of no pilot program done for the World Wide Web. It was just put out there. Um, and I, I think we, we are still learning now some of, the, uh, some of the potential applications and some of the implications for society. So uh, what we want to do in CCAV is, is really to try to ask the questions about how things like mobility as a service and connected and autonomous vehicles uh, might be used, what might the business models be, so that we can understand what is the best approach for government to take. Um, so uh, my brief for this section was uh, just to think about uh, mobility as a service and connected and autonomous vehicles um, and to kind of examine who's in control and what are, what are some of the issues we, we, we might want to discuss later in the day. Um, so I'll just quickly kind of highlight some of the things that I have noted. Um, firstly, with regard to mobility as a service, um, you know, what, what will be the impact on, on the journeys we make? So. Um, what will happen to our kind of agency of decision over those journeys? So currently, if I want to go from A to B, I, I live in London, I have a, a huge number of options available to me to do that. So there are many different routes I can take, many different modes that I can use. Um, and, and I'm free, really, to choose what combination I kind of bolt together to, to make that journey. Um, but in a, a, a mobility as a service kind of world, if you're buying something as a service, you're buying um, much more kind of based on outcome. Um, and the path and the means to achieving that outcome uh, may no longer be um, completely within your control. So, uh, you know, I, I may put my journey into my, uh, you know, I, I may pass my journey to my mobility as a service provider, which could be a city mapper, an Uber, or someone completely different. Um, and they may determine how I make that journey. So what are the different component elements of that? Um, and I think there are some questions, you know, to, are, are we comfortable with that? Are we OK with that? You know, if, if that mobility as a service provider is Transport for London, for example, um, then they uh, have certain policy objectives they may want to meet with that journey. So uh, they may want to improve air quality and try to encourage me to cycle or walk rather than uh, perhaps using a car share or, or some other means of transport. Um, but if that is a, a commercial enterprise who is providing that journey to me as a service, um, then that the, the components of that journey might be influenced by some of the um, strategic partnerships and alliances and commercial relationships that they have. So, so what might that look like? Um, also, how regularly um, may, might we travel in future? Um, so particularly in a world of connected and autonomous vehicles, John's already talked about um, you know, how, how productive will these vehicles be. So at the moment, I think there are statistics that say that something like 96% of the time cars are parked, 4% they're actually kind of making useful journeys. Um, in a world of uh, autonomous vehicles, can we kind of flip that on its head and have those vehicles spending most of their time picking up and dropping off people? Um, and if we can do that, what does that do to the cost of travel? Does it become significantly cheaper? 
Um, does it become kind of easier? Um, particularly with autonomous vehicles, might it become more comfortable? So uh, if you don't need to have your, if, you, if your hands off, eyes off, as we call it, level five full autonomy, and you don't need to be paying attention to the road, how can you model the inside of your car? You know, you don't need to have people sitting, looking forward, looking out of the vehicle. So you could have people sitting around a table doing, doing work or whatever. Um, so I think that, that that use of those vehicles as well raises some interesting questions. Um, I'm sure there are people in the room who have been hearing for many years how uh, robotics and automation are going to free up all of their time and they won't need to work anymore and we'll have a, a three-day working week and all of these things. Um, and I, you know, that, that we, we still haven't got that. And in fact, if anything, I think probably people feel they, they're working more hours than they ever have been in the past. Um, so I think, you know, to what extent will, will these technologies um, actually sort of emancipate us or actually will these vehicles just become an extension of our office? So will we be expected as soon as we're, we get into the vehicle actually to open our computers and, and, and start working? So, so what will that look like? Um, what will it do to public services? So um, will we continue to have uh, kind of centralised models where we maybe have a few hospitals and GPs and schools and things and... Uh, we travel to those places or will we have more of a distributed model where perhaps our you know, GPs and care workers and health service and th services and things actually travel to us? So, so what will that look like? And also, to what extent will it be possible um, not to participate in these new models of mobility? So um, will we see a, a, a situation in which there is such momentum behind them um, that it becomes very difficult not to be part of those systems? So um, anyone who lives in London is, probably knows that you can no longer get on a bus and pay with cash. So it's entirely cashless on the buses now. Um, so will we start to see some of these shifts um, in our overall models of mobility? Um, Impact on the economy as well. Um, I haven't seen this film, so I, 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 I have to take this second hand. Um, if anyone has seen Wally, -E, I think it's called, um, I'm told it's just lots of kind of very obese people being driven around everywhere. Um, so, you know, will, will, will we become that, that kind of, you know, what, what will it look like in a world of connected and autonomous vehicles if, if, if we can just uh, call a car up on our smartphone or whatever and it comes to our door and drops us off exactly where we want to be? Um, what will it mean in terms of how active we are and, and our health? Um, you know, what will that look like? Um, and, and, and could the state be, be forced to intervene if, if, that, if, if, if that looks as though uh, it's becoming, becoming an issue? And I think, you know, how, how will the economy be structured? Um, so who will these mobility providers be? Um, will it be Google, Facebook, Uber, Apple? Or, or will it be our kind of current transport authorities, Transport for London, Transport for Greater Manchester, for example? Um, and, you know, will, will we see a move towards, uh, I guess, fewer very wealthy global corporates? Um, and what will that do for tax take? So I, I think the most recent figures I saw said Google are paying corporation tax of about 3p in every pound. Um, so, so, so what will that mean? Um, but also, could mobility as a service be uh, a means of effectively actually um, charging for access to the transport network? So could, could we actually allocate that space um, by, by charging? So not the sort of road user charging that government has looked at in the past, where there has been a very, uh, I suppose, explicit charge on the end user. And it's been, uh, in that sense, it's been very unpopular and also a very kind of politically unpopular as well. Politicians haven't, haven't really wanted to, to explore that. But actually, if it could be done in a way where uh, there's almost a level of abstraction there between the end user, um, would, would that be a better mechanism for actually allocating access to that road network and use of that road space? Um, uh, impact on our towns and cities and urban environment. Um, a couple of the previous speakers have, have already talked about parking, so I, I won't talk about that too much. Um, but I think there are likely to be very different ways that we can and will use our, our spaces. Um, will people choose to live elsewhere if transport connections uh, or, or, or transport uh, provision improves? So uh, will connected and autonomous vehicles mean that actually people don't feel they need to live so close to their place of work. Um, you could, for example, uh, you know, if you live a long way away, you could get into a, uh, an autonomous vehicle um, and, and sleep for most of the trip if you wanted to. Um, so, so how will that change where people choose um, to live and then to work? Um, and then finally, um, 
impact on, on people. Um, so currently we provide a lot of subsidy for public transport services. Um, some of those are, are, are very heavily subsidised. Um, so rural bus services is a great example of that. Um, they will often kind of run around mostly empty. Um, they, 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 they cost a lot to run in terms of subsidy. So would mobility as a service um, actually provide a model to change how that subsidy works? And rather than to subsidise the services, actually to subsidise the per subsidise individuals. Um, so that could, for example, be some kind of mobility account or mobility credits. Um, that the individual can draw down against in a more flexible way, potentially to use different types of modes of transport. Um, and that may also, um, this idea of some kind of mobility account and uh, the mobility as a service platform, there may also be some levers for government there as well in terms of uh, thinking about taxation and incentivisation. So, um, for example, if we want to encourage uh, more sustainable travel, um, we could provide a subsidy where, which is um, depleted less for people who are travelling, say, on, on bikes, for example, and depleted more, for example, for people um, maybe using car-based transport or travelling at peak time in areas where there are uh, particular congestion problems. Um, so there are potentially some, some new tools at hand as well, um, as long as we are careful about how we approach that. So thank you very much.